I'm Chuck Stout, curator at the Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum. Today we're going to go behind the wings of a carrier-based, twin-engine, four-seat, electronic warfare aircraft, the Grumman EA-6B Prowler. We're also going to meet a naval flight officer who flew the Prowler and taught other people to fly it. This is going to be cool. It's time to go behind the wings. Here at Wings Over the Rockies, we have more than 70 amazing aircraft and spacecraft in our historic World War II era hangar, including the Grumman EA-6B Prowler. Let's take a closer look. Wings Over the Rockies EA-6B was one of the very last Prowlers to be retired. It came to the museum in May 2015, almost directly from its last combat assignment serving on the USS George H.W. Bush in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. This airplane served with Electronic Attack Squadron VAQ-134, the Garudas. And what, I hear you ask, is a Garuda? According to the squadron history, in Hindu mythology, the Garuda was the bird that took Vishnu to wherever he needed to go to protect creation from the evil forces that wanted to upset and destroy it. The EA-6B is a major redesign of the Grumman A-6 Intruder, a two-seat Navy ground attack airplane that's really famous for its service in the Vietnam War. Grumman designed the larger EA-6B Prowler specifically for electronic warfare. That's what the E is for. Now that essentially means blinding, jamming, or fooling an enemy's radar and communication equipment. The EA-6B is more than five feet longer to make room for the two more electronic countermeasures officers for a total crew of four. And it also has a big fairing on the vertical tail that carries more electronic equipment. The first Prowlers entered service in 1971. The Navy retired theirs in 2015, and the Marines used theirs until 2019. They were usually deployed on aircraft carriers. That way they could work in any part of the world, using aerial refueling to extend their range. The airplane was armed with a variety of electronic equipment to confuse, disrupt, suppress, disable, or deceive a wide range of enemy electronic devices and systems, including detection and targeting radars, missile guidance systems, navigation equipment, data links, communication equipment. They also prevented IED attacks by jamming the cell phones and garage door openers that were used to detonate the bombs remotely. In addition to attacking enemy radio and radar electronically, the EA-6B could also fire missiles to destroy enemy electronic installations on the ground. For example, the radar sites that guide surface-to-air missiles. The Prowler could also perform electronic intelligence work, listening to enemy electronic signals to gather valuable information. To make this episode even better, we've got a naval flight officer who flew the Prowler, Ethan Williams. So Ethan, what got you interested into flying and how did you get into the Prowler? I grew up in Colorado Springs in an Air Force family and I decided to buck family tradition and attended the United States Naval Academy, graduating the mighty class of 1997. From there, I was selected to go into Naval Flight Officer training. The Navy gave me an opportunity to fly jets and I said I couldn't pass that up. Went through the strike pipeline and ultimately selected the EA-6B Prowler flying out of Whidbey Island, Washington. So how would you describe the EA-6B and what was it like to fly it? Well, the A6B's primary mission was the suppression of enemy air defenses, jamming of enemy radars to prevent them targeting our planes with surface air missiles or anti-aircraft artillery. That mission evolved over the years where we uh, eventually got into communications jamming, and then later in the Prowler's life, we were denying uh, radio-controlled IEDs and, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. In terms of flying the airplane, it was a lot of fun. It was a really great machine to fly, especially down low as the Intruder was designed as a low-level attack plane. This plane uh, was a lot of fun to fly down low. However, for most of our mission profiles, we would fly up higher, up in the uh, 20,000 to 30,000 foot uh, altitude. So not as much uh, yanking and banking at those altitudes as it was down low, but uh, definitely a lot of fun. So this is a pretty neat airplane. Why don't we go look at the cockpit? Sounds good. So this must be kind of nostalgic. What's going through your mind right now? Well, reverted back to old uh, pre-flight mode in terms of coming into the cockpit, making sure the canopy was pinned safely here, our ejection seats were safe, generally just settling back in and uh, seeing an old friend. This is where the pilot sits, but 
there's three other people in this airplane. Tell us about what went on. Yeah, one of the interesting things you'll notice about the Prowler is that there's only one set of flight controls, and that's in the front left seat. That's where our naval aviator, our pilot, would sit and fly the airplane. Now, myself as a naval flight officer, my mission, I was an electronic countermeasures officer, or ECMO. I was sat in the front right seat for some missions where I was responsible for operating the navigation systems in the airplane, the communication systems, the radar. Down here to the right is the panel for the high-speed anti-radiation missile, or HARM. And the big hole on the instrument panel in front of me is where the USQ-113 communications jammer box went. That was a high demand, low density resource that the Prowler community didn't have a lot of. So oftentimes those were cross-decked between squadrons. So one carrier was coming off station, the other carrier was coming on station. They would fly those between the carriers and swap them into the uh, airplanes that were then going on to fly the missions over whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan. So I noticed that the canopy has a little bit of a amber tint to it. Is that significant? So the canopies are in fact gold plated. The gold plating was put in there to protect the air crew during missions as the airplane was emitting a lot of electromagnetic energy trying to jam enemy radars and communications. So I mean, the gold canopies are a good reminder of how many signals are out there in the electromagnetic spectrum. So I noticed that the other ECMOs are quite a distance behind you. It's not like being in a, a car. How was the division of labor between the crew stations? So with four crew members in the airplane, it was essential that the crew work together as a crew. Where the two ECMOs in the back seats, as we call them ECMOs two and three, were responsible then for operating the ALQ-99 tactical jamming system, which was the main weapon that we used to jam against enemy radars. And so they would oftentimes split up the certain geographic locations where they were working or certain frequency bands so that they, we didn't have a duplication of work. Now I know that when you were flying the airplane in combat, you were necessarily a long distance from the carrier. So that entailed air-to-air -air refueling. So tell me what it's like to make a hit on a tanker in a Prowler. Air-to-air -air refueling was essential for the Prowler to be able to complete its mission, especially over places like Afghanistan where not a coastal nation. So oftentimes our missions there were sometimes six to eight hours or longer and required multiple trips to the Air Force big wing tanker to go get gas. So we relied on our refueling probe right on the uh, front of the nose here. Notice the refueling probe is slightly tilted a little bit to the right. That was designed after the A6, who refueling probe was straight up and down to give the pilot some increased visibility. So normally when we'd go to the tanker, it was pretty challenging because we'd have a lot of airplanes in a small space, and then we'd have airplanes actually touching airplanes. One of the things I always teach in flight school is to uh, never swap paint with another airplane. Well, it was always a weird sensation when we'd have the probe that would go into the basket there and think these two airplanes are connected. But we're always glad to take that gas to help us complete the mission and to get back to the boat safely. Probably my most memorable refueling experience was where we actually didn't get fuel one night. On October 7th, 2001, I was part of the first strikes into Afghanistan following the events of September 11th. We pulled up to our tanker just uh, south of Afghanistan, ready to get our gas and plugged in and immediately the plane was sprayed with fuel. So immediately our pilot backs out of the basket. We try to get back in, try to get more gas. At this point, we're watching the fuel gauge down here to the uh, pilot's right knee there and watching that tick down as we're not getting gas and it continues to spray the airplane. Eventually we decided that that tanker was a no-go and we eventually had to uh, fly back to the aircraft carrier without completing our mission that night. The good news is most of the time our refueling worked. Uh, the pilots were always experts in getting into the basket, staying in the basket, and getting us the gas we need. So Ethan, this has been great, but there's a lot more to this airplane than just the cockpit. What do you say we go take a look at the football on the tail? Sounds good. So we mentioned that this airplane also collected electronic intelligence, ELINT, and this is where that happened, right? Yes, one of the most notable features about the Prowler is that big bulge on top of the tail, as we called it, the football. And that's where the receivers for the ALQ-99 jamming system were located. So that's where we would pick up those enemy radars, enemy transmissions, things like that. Those would be received by the sensors in the football at the top, and then the two bulges on the side of the tail, those are for our lower frequency receivers. 
That information then would all be transmitted through the plane to our electronic countermeasures officers, the ECMOs in the back two seats, who could then look at the signal, identify it, determine if it was a threat, and if need be, then steer one of our jamming pods onto that to deny them that signal. The receivers in the football were essential to the Prowler's mission because yes, we could transmit and we could jam, but we'd be jamming blindly. With this, we could receive precision targeted information that then we could put the right electrons onto the right target. Now, since the very dawn of carrier aviation, airplanes can't land on a ship without some kind of arresting gear. And that's usually the tail hook that catches wires on the deck. So please tell us about the tail hook on the EA-6B. There's nothing more symbolic of naval aviation than the tail hook. So the tail hook on the prowler during flight was actually up inside the body of the airplane for aerodynamic purposes. Plus, we didn't need it dangling down, catching on anything like that. As we'd come into land, one of the first things we'd do is put the hook down. The pilot would reach over his right hand, pull a lever. We didn't have a, a hook-shaped lever like some of uh, naval aircraft do. We actually just had a, a pull lever that we would pull and the hook would come down. And the hook was actually two parts. It was kind of a, a frame that came down and then what we called the stinger, which is probably about a 60 pound piece of metal, which actually had the hook on it that then was uh, disposable, so to speak, in terms of, you know, that only got a certain number of traps on that. It would be, have to be inspected after every flight, end of the day, every 100 traps. And if it ever failed inspection, that stinger would come off and we'd get a brand new stinger on the aircraft. Aircraft carrier operations were about as much fun as you could have in the EA-6B. From the launch where we're sitting there you know, zero miles per hour to within just a few seconds, 160 miles an hour. That's a real kick in the pants as we get catapulted off of the front end of the carrier. Now coming back and landing on the carrier, daytime, again, a lot of fun because you just get into the daytime pattern, you bag some traps as we call it, uh, fill up that log book with your arrested landings. Now, Nighttime landings, a whole different story. So oftentimes we're up there, it's pitch black. All we can maybe see is a pinpoint of light out there on the horizon, which is the carrier. As we get closer, it gets a little brighter, but it's still not that bright. And really we're only working off of a couple of visual cues out there, working off the lineup of the ship, working off of the meatball, which shows the uh, glide slope of the aircraft coming in. And we, especially when we trapped at night, the first thing I'd always do after we uh, trapped and again, got ourselves back, put back together, I'd reach over, pat my pilot on the left leg and say, great job, buddy. So if you miss all those wires, you're still going, what, 160 miles an hour. And how do they allow for that? So if we missed a wire, we had to keep going. Our normal approach speed in the prowl was right around 130 knots. And so as we touched down, what the pilot would instantly do is immediately go to full power, put those throttles all the way forward, just in case we missed, so that then we would have the engine spooled up, ready to go around for another pass. So we've talked about several of the characteristics about the airplane itself. They all have to work together in order to perform the mission. Now you flew this airplane more than 10 years operationally. What was it like to fly it in combat? The effectiveness of the Prowler in combat was due to its adaptability. When I first came into the Prowler community in the late 90s, we were thinking those traditional surface-to-air missile missions where we would jam their radars to prevent them from uh, hitting our strikers. Now, fast forward to 2001, October, we're responding to uh, Afghanistan, and we really then embraced the communications jamming mission. We didn't jam a single radar after about the third day of Operation Enduring Freedom, but instead we shifted to jamming enemy communications, whether that was cell phones, push-to-talk radios, uh, satellite phones, to try to help uh, support the ground forces there. The Prowler mission further evolved, beginning of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Once the fall of the Iraq military, then the insurgency came up and they were using radio-controlled improvised explosive devices, the roadside bombs that they were setting off with car alarms or garage door openers, key fobs, things like that. Well, again, our smart guys in the Prowler community came up with another mission for us where we had then had the ability to, depending on the threat, either deny that detonation or pre-detonate that roadside bomb before a friendly convoy would go by that. So I think that was really kind of the, one of the marks of the Prowler was that over the last 20 years of its service life, how it adapted from its you know, traditional, call it Cold War mission, into a counterinsurgency mission. So even though the Prowler's not flying anymore, what's the legacy of the EA-6B? 
The legacy of the Prowler is carried on now through the E818G Growler, our new next generation uh, jamming platform based on the proven Boeing Super Hornet airframe. Now within the larger Navy, part of the legacy of the Prowler is now that electronic warfare has a seat at the table with mission planning from the start. It's no longer an afterthought where our attack guys would go plan and the electronic warfare guys would come in. Now they're there from the start. Well, Ethan, this has been a terrific interview. Thank you very much, and thank you for sharing what you know about the Prowler with our visitors. Thank you. We couldn't cover everything, so please leave your questions and comments under the video, and we'll get to as many as we can. And come to the museum and see this awesome airplane. Now, we've come to the end of the video, and if you subscribe, thank you very much. And if you don't subscribe, hey, just subscribe already, okay? I gotta get back to work.